Okay, everybody. If you're still coming in, perhaps you want to try and find a seat. Um, so I want to get started on time because I've created way too long a lecture. Um, and uh, there's just so much to say. We could have an entire 10 week class on really just the topics we're going to talk about today. So I'm going to try and not waffle. I'm going to try and get to the point as much as possible um, so that you get a little bit of an overview of some of the issues related to um, our future climate. And you can see I put a big question mark because really a lot of it is very uncertain. Okay? A lot of it really does depend very much on us. And so today we're going to look at some of the science but we're also going to start looking at some of the human factors behind why we might see change in our future. Um, so as a reminder, quiz 10, if you haven't got full credit yet on your quizzes, here he gives you another opportunity to um, up your score a little bit. Um, if you have already got full scores, then this is a, just a nice way of seeing whether you've understood the topics that we've been learning recently. Admin stuff, extra credit, I've said all of this before, it's due by Sunday at midnight if you'd like to submit it. Um, regrades, any regrades must be done before the final, um, there won't be any regrades afterwards. And also course evaluations are open and I really do love to hear constructive criticism from you guys about how I can improve the class. You've benefited from feedback from previous classes um, and I do really want to hear what you think would help you learn a little bit better. Um, so please do let us know, both me and the TAs would very much appreciate your feedback there. The final is next week, it's a week today, this time next week you'll be in it unfortunately. Um, so it's from 1.30 so please remember that the time is earlier so don't show up at 2 because you'll miss the first half an hour. It's the same format. It's also going to be a long exam, but it shouldn't be as time restricted as last time. But you should still sort of keep on track. Um, the main differences are instead of a little note card, you're allowed a full page of notes, but please one-sided only, otherwise you could more or less recreate everything um, that you would need. Um, the study guide's available, the answers to the midterm are available. I've reopened all of the quizzes so that you can practice using those. So anything quiz 1 to 9, you can now take as many times as you like. Quiz 10, please only take three times and then I'll reopen it. Yes? Can you type your page of notes? You can type your page of notes if you want. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, and then there will be a final review session. That's going to be from 7 till 8 p.m. on Tuesday. I'm sorry that it's so late, but that was the only time we could get a room. So bring your questions then for the TAs. Do you have any questions about that? Yes. Thursday the 12th of June. Oh yes, yeah, sorry. I will be in my office Thursday the 12th, the same day as the exam. Sorry about that. Yeah. Any others? Okay, I'll fix that in the, the notes for after class. So, my main points from Tuesday, which was a thoroughly depressing lecture, today is hopefully partly depressing, partly optimistic. I've put some optimistic stuff at the end. Um, so our main points was our climate is changing and it's changing rapidly. Our atmosphere has been warming. We've been seeing increased extremes in temperature, increased heat waves. Um, wet places have been getting wetter. Dry places have been getting drier. That's true here as well. Uh, oceans are also warming. As they warm, they expand and sea level has been rising. As well as that, we have ice melting because of those warmer temperatures, which again contributes to the sea level rise. As well as them warming up, those oceans are also becoming more acidic. And that's a very simple response to the increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. As so we increase that, we increase the amount of carbon dioxide dissolved in the ocean water. And that just sort of nice chemical reactions means that it makes it more acidic. We know that with a great amount of certainty and you'll see that uh, today as we look forward in time too. And really we're already starting to see the effects on the biosphere. We're seeing changes in the length of growing season and the timing of events within our ecosystem such as the hatching of certain things, the migrations of certain things. We're seeing expansion of, um, for example, disease vectors, things like mosquitoes into areas that weren't there before, which are, is affecting directly the human health um, in various places. Uh, we're seeing things like pine beetles, which aren't 
killed off any longer in the cold winters, starting to impact uh, forest ecosystems in the US. So we're seeing change, and it's changing very rapidly. If we look at all of the different factors that we've talked about that can control our climate, really we can narrow it down. The main culprit is those greenhouse gases. Yes, all of these other things have a role to play, but the main reason that we're seeing change, the main reason we'll see change in the future, is our greenhouse gases. Okay? And we can, sh we can sort of plot things like that. And we're really very scientifically certain about the role that carbon uh, dioxide and methane and these other greenhouse gases play in controlling our climate. It's really not a surprise if there's more of them in the atmosphere, they absorb more of that outgoing infrared energy. We've known about that for more than 100 years. It's not really a stunning surprise. Um, and these other things, things like aerosols, we know less about. Um, they're much more complicated, but really they're not the main reason that climate is warming. If anything, they would have a cooling effect. So really we're concentrating on greenhouse gases in particular, and especially carbon dioxide. That gas sticks around longer in our atmosphere, it's more difficult to get rid of it, um, and we're emitting more and more and more of it. And the reason that we're emitting more and more and more of it is because our population is very rapidly growing. And at the same time, we've seen this enormous increase in population. We are becoming more energy demanding. We now have three million phones and computers, um, and we want to drive long distances. So per person, the energy demand is increasing. And the way that we get that energy is by burning fossil fuels. Um, and so you can see that just within our lifetime, within your parents' lifetime, within your grandparents' lifetime, there has been an enormous change in our population. We've more or less trebled since the 1950s. Uh, we're looking at further increases in that population. And remember that that population isn't going to be nice and evenly spread around the world. A lot of those new people are going to be in very, very populated areas, areas that are already environmentally stressed. Um, and that is a problem. And lastly, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, it really is us. We've looked at all of the different isotopes. We did that on Tuesday. Um, and we can add up pretty nicely what is going into our atmosphere, and we can track what's going out. And really, the re main reason behind that increase in carbon dioxide in greenhouse gases is both deforestation, so changing the land use. So we removed a lot of forests in the US and elsewhere but mainly fossil fuel burning. If we want to look at the concern going into the future, fossil fuel burning is really what's contributing the most CO2 to the atmosphere today, and we are gonna keep doing that. Okay? If you deforest an area once, it's more or less gone. Okay? Whereas fossil fuels can keep building up. So, with that in mind, what we're going to talk about today is what is our climate therefore going to be like by 2100? We're already observing change, what will our climate be like given different sort of factors by 2100? That's something that we all deeply want to know because we're going to be living in that world. Um, how will those effects um, affect, or how will those changes affect us, the human populations, but also natural ecosystems around the world? And we forget just to what extent we do rely on those natural ecosystems, even whether it's things like having bees and insects to pollinate crops, um, they sort of what we call ecosystem services that we don't necessarily quantify in our economy but are important. And lastly, which is our optimistic bit, what can we do to avoid the most extreme changes? This week was really pretty spectacular in terms of some first action to make really significant cuts to carbon emissions in the US. And so we're going to take a quick look at what actually those new regulations might entail and how that will affect our potential climate in future. OK, so first of all, what is our climate going to be like? Well, we can't just wave a magic wand and say, we're increasing CO2, therefore we know exactly what will happen. We can't necessarily do it just sort of by asking someone. Really, if we want to understand how our climate is going to change, we need to think about the consequences of all of those different things. Because increasing CO2 is going to change the oceans, it's going to change the amount of ice, it's going to change the type of uh, biology, it's going to change the vegetation types in different places. So we really need a way 
of quantifying all of these different things. And really, the only way that we're ever going to do that is in computer models. It's such a complex system. This is where computers and the advances in computers are so important in helping us understand much more about our climate system. So this is what our little climate model would look like if we had a picture of it rather than just pages of equations. It would look a bit like this. We split the world up into sort of a kilometer by kilometer grid or a little bit bigger than that. And then we have sort of boxes representing different depths in the ocean going down into the depths. And we also have different boxes rec uh, representing the atmosphere as we go further and further up in the atmosphere. Okay? And so you can see that we have to represent both the land, the atmosphere, those different levels, the troposphere, the stratosphere. We represent the ocean, and so the motion of the ocean and uh, also how, what sort of carbon is doing within the ocean. We have ice, we have our big ice sheets, we have the sea ice that appears and is so important for our albedo. We have the biosphere, and that means that the vegetation in our climate model changes as the temperature and the precipitation changes. It's really neat. Um, and then, of course, we have that movement. All of those things are relatively stationary, but really they're there because of the movement of water the movement of carbon dioxide, even the movement of nutrients, things like nitrogen, um, phosphorus. These are all things that we need to think about. So unsurprisingly, these are extremely complicated. And we make certain compromises because otherwise it would take longer to run the model than it would for the actual climate to change. Okay? So we do make compromises, but we've come a long way. And so just as an indication of how far we've come, this shows, you know, those IPCC reports I brought in, the really enormous books. That was the, I think, fifth report that we've had. If you look back at the very first report and the type of climate models that we were running at that time, then you can see it looks like one of these old computer games from like the 80s, and you're too young to even remember that. It's really blocky. We don't have great resolution. It's going to be difficult to get some of that fine scale um, controls into our climate models. But then we have the second report of that IPCC. It's got really exponentially better. The third annual report, and now we have the fourth annual report. You can really see that we get things like topography much better. Um, we're going to be able to better represent um, the climate system. And partly this is due to better computing power as that gets uh, improved. And also we understand things better too. So all of these things are important. But I'm not going to tell you that it's perfect. It's definitely not perfect. It's an amazingly good representation, but it's certainly not perfect. And there are some things that we really don't get right very easily. Okay? So the biggest uncertainties so far are things like the response of clouds and precipitation. Because remember when we talked about clouds, we said they have a complicated effect on our climate, depending on whether they're low cloud or whether they're high cloud, whether they're there in the day, whether they're in, there in the night. They're also not present on the Earth in nice kilometer by kilometer by kilometer blocks. Um, we really don't sort of model those terribly well. And so that's something that we are working on, and we are making pretty good strides forward in that. Um, but that's why we are much more uncertain going forward, perhaps what rainfall will do. And um, the other one is sudden tipping points. Okay, it's the potential for sudden shifts in our climate. So, for, so all of a sudden we hit some critical threshold and a lot of our sea ice disappears. It's not terribly easy to get that sort of behavior in our model. Um, and it's certainly difficult for us to work out what that threshold is. Um, so that's something that we would also like uh, to improve on. Ice sheets. Ice sheets, things like Greenland, Antarctica, where there's so much of that ice and where their response is going to have such a control on sea level, it's really difficult to model those. And again, we have people in our department and elsewhere who are really working on improving this because we would love to know what sea level is going to do with much more certainty. Um, they're just difficult things to model. There's a lot of factors that go into those. But the main point is that even with these other uncertainties about the science and how the system functions and why our models are different, by far the greatest cause of our uncertainty in what our climate is going to be like by 2100 is us. What are we going to do? What decisions are we going to make about how we generate our power? What is our population going to be? 
how much do we, action do we take to preserve the environment as opposed to preserving our economy? Those are all really important questions, and that's really going to be the largest effect and the largest uncertainty as we look forward. Okay? So, we have created, to deal with this uncertainty in, in us, what we call representative concentration pathways which is quite a mouthful to say, so we simplify that to be RCP, so representative concentration pathways. And these are just different theoretical ideas about what the future might be like based on human factors, things like population, energy demand, how we generate that energy, um, sort of what sort of policies we enact. Okay. And so here are our four RCP scenarios. These are the ones that we're going to look at. And you can see that they have different numbers after them. So we have RCP 2.6, 4.5, 6.0, and 8.5. So what do those numbers actually mean? So do you remember when I showed you quite a way back now? Let's flick back for a second, if it can. That one, finally. So do you remember that we looked at this graph on Tuesday and we said that this is sort of zero. Anything above that is a, an amount of warming. Anything below that is cooling. And really right now we can say that we see a warming effect of about 2.5 watts per meter squared due to these greenhouse gas concentrations. And we saw how that has been increasing through time as we've been getting larger and larger greenhouse gas. So that's basically two and a half extra watts for every meter squared. Okay? So if we then look at our ICPs, that's what that number represents. If we talk about RCP 2.6, what we mean is that by 2100, whatever combination of human factors are involved, we're going to have enough CO2 in our atmosphere that we get an extra 2.6 watts for every meter squared of the Earth. Pretty similar today. That's really our best case scenario. If we go to our worst case scenario, we're talking about 8.5 extra watts per meter squared of the Earth's surface. And that's a really much larger change. That's more or less our worst case scenario. Okay? So we're going to look at those two extremes today and see what happens as we go through time. So I think it's really interesting to look at what goes into creating these curves. So for those different scenarios, we have different ideas of what the population might be. For our best case scenario, we tend to level off at about 9 billion people by about 2050. In our worst case scenario, our RCP 8.5, really our population keeps growing and probably hits close to 12 billion by 2100. It's a lot of extra people. It's almost double the population of today. Okay? And then we can also look at things like what the energy demand is. So the height of those columns there represent the amount of energy that we think the world will need in those different scenarios. So here's how much energy we required for the whole world in 2000. And these different colors represent different ways that we generated that energy. So black is coal, um, orange is oil, this is natural gas, and green is bioenergy. So for each of these different scenarios, you can see that we have different requirements of energy for all of the people on Earth. And we also get that energy in different combinations of these energy sources. Okay? So for our best case scenario, we're still using quite a bit of fossil fuels, but we've massively expanded nuclear, we've massively expanded the amount of bioenergy we use, which is when we grow corn or something like that and we turn it into ethanol or a fuel that we can, we can use, um, and then hydro and solar power. But if you look at our 8.5, our worst case, we need a lot more energy, it's a lot more people, um, and we're certainly generating a huge amount of that through coal, but also we still have a significant amount of all a natural gas. But still, even in this scenario, we've massively expanded nuclear, bioenergy, hydro, and especially solar to meet that energy demand. Okay? And if we turn that into basically what our emissions would be each year, currently we're emitting maybe six to seven gigatons of carbon each year globally. If we look at our best case scenario, something a bit strange happens. Okay? And that is, and in about 2020, we hit a peak. And then, optimistically, we start decreasing. 
to the point that in 2070 or 2080 or so, we are actually, as a global civilization, emitting zero carbon to the atmosphere. Okay? So this is our best case scenario. In our worst case scenario, we burn everything. Okay? And so we're really up at 30 gigatons per year. That's sort of five times what we emit so far. That's what we call our business as usual. Basically, we just go on as before. Okay? And certainly, if those different emission scenarios are true, then we get different amounts of CO2 in our atmosphere by the end of the century. Okay? Our best case scenario is about more or less what we are now, close to 400. Our worst case is sort of up near 1,000 ppm. And for those of you in discussion, you saw the last time we had concentrations at about 1,000 ppm was tens of millions of years ago. Very, very long time ago. So, tell me, how optimistic are you feeling on the last day of classes? Which of these scenarios do you think is most likely? So, what do you think? What's going to happen to our emissions through time? Okay, so let's see how uh, pessimistic or optimistic you're feeling. Not terribly optimistic then, in general, okay? So we have maybe 10% who think that we can follow our best case scenario path. Um, and good for you, I hope we do. I'm not sure it's terribly likely. Um, but the rest of you think that we're probably going to follow one of these much higher paths. We're still going to be emitting CO2 in the future. Okay? And some of you are feeling particularly uh, pessimistic today. So I, what I want you to do is keep an eye on your particular scenario. Okay? So I'm going to show you now, given the choice that you made, um, what that means in terms of what aspects of our climate will look like by 2100. So you can see what your world will appear like by 2100 if that holds true. So first of all, temperature. Okay? This shows our sort of instrumental temperature record up to 2000 or so. And then it shows what those different emissions pathways would lead to in terms of our temperature change. So with our best case scenario, we see maybe a change of, say, one degree Celsius by 2100. It's not great, but it's pretty reasonable. At the upper end, we're looking at a change of more like four degrees Celsius. And that's actually really quite significant. Okay? And I want to sort of talk a little bit more about this because four degrees Celsius, I know you're all Fahrenheit people anyway, it's maybe six or so Fahrenheit, I think. It doesn't sound like a lot when we experience huge daily swings in temperature. But that is really a huge change in the global average. Because remember, it's not necessarily going to be a changing the same in each place. And if we compare that with longer term records, you can get a sense of how big this change is. So here's our temperature records, our reconstructed from proxy records back to 1000 AD. Okay. So within this, you might have heard of the Little Ice Age. And yes, there was a Little Ice Age. It was here. It was much colder. And the medieval warm period, yes, that was here. It was much warmer. Okay. But really, that's nothing. Okay. This is the potential range of those temperatures by 2100. You can see how quickly we're changing the world away from what it's been like for a very, very long time. And for those of you that have a long summer ahead with nothing to do, um, then this book is a really interesting book. This guy basically took all of the scientific literature that said what the world would look like if it was one degree warmer, what it would look like if it was two degrees, then three degrees, then four degrees, five and six. They're very short chapters because we really don't have a good idea of what the world will look like by then. Um, and they also put a little video together. And you've heard a lot of me in the past few weeks, so I was going to play you the little video. As it does every six years, and projected an average temperature rise of between one and six degrees centigrade by the end of this century. The new IPCC report, released in February 2007, kept the same essential scale, although they now think it's as little as one degree is very unlikely whilst the worst case scenario is up to 6.4 Celsius. Six thousand years ago, it was just under the degree warmer than it is now in today's North America. Huge areas of desert cover the Great Plains, from southern Texas right up to Canada. A warming climate is likely to lead to devastating droughts in the U.S. Midwest, far worse than the Dust Bowl of the 1930s. 
Because the open warming is amplified at the poles, one degree will see the continuing disappearance of the Arctic ice cap. 2007 could record the lowest ice cover extent ever, effectively pushing species such as polar bears, walruses, and ringed seals right off the top of the planet. One model study shows that, with one degree of warming, 63 out of 65 animal species lose a third of their core habitat. The same goes for the Cape Floristic area in South Africa, as well as many amphibian species in Central America. The world's coral reefs are expected to see so much bleaching in the warmer seas that they will be practically destroyed. At two degrees, we will see another impact on the marine environment, which has nothing to do with global warming. The oceans become acidic, which in turn dissolve creatures like krill, the very basis of the marine food chain. If these disappear, it will affect creatures that prey on them, such as fish, sharks, whales, dolphins, and eventually humans. Every summer will be as hot as 2003, when 30,000 people died from heat stroke across Europe, including 600 Londoners. And if that becomes normal, the extremes will see Middle Eastern temperatures in Europe, putting the death tolls perhaps in hundreds of thousands. The entire Greenland ice cap will be eventually eliminated. Ice will also be melting in the world's mountain ranges. The disappearance of most of the Andean glaciers will remove much of the fresh water, which keeps the rivers flowing to the populated desert coast. A similar problem is likely to evolve in California, where a reduction in snowpack in the Sierra Nevada will see major cities going thirsty. This is already happening now. According to modelling studies, up to a third of species alive today will eventually become extinct. This will be the worst mass extinction to hit the planet since the end of the Cretaceous period, 65 million years ago. Now at this point I need to stop and assess where we currently are. According to the best scientific information, we are already committed to one degree of warming because of historical emissions, so there's nothing we can do to avoid it. In emissions terms, we'll be over the two degrees level within the next 10 or 20 years, which explains why the situation is so urgent. But this does mean, to look on the bright side, that all of the rest of the impacts I'm going to show you still need not happen. If we can change our energy and emissions in time, we can still avoid ever reaching a world three or more degrees hotter than today. In the three degree world, we're likely to cross one of the most important thresholds of all the point at which the Amazon rainforest no longer receives enough rainfall and basically begins to burn down, pouring huge amounts of carbon back into the atmosphere. Forests and soils worldwide are expected to add another 1.5 degrees centigrade, taking us straight into the 4 degree world. The Kalahari Desert spreads across Botswana and much of southern Africa. Australia loses so much rainfall that agriculture in most urban centres become non-viable. Hurricanes strengthen to Category 6, Hurricane Katrina was Category 4, and pummel the tropical coastlines. On the other side of 4 degrees lie still more tipping points, principally the likely release of millions of tonnes of methane from the Siberian permafrost. Once this thaws, it will boost global temperatures still further, taking us right on up to the next level. The Arctic ice cap will already have gone completely, so this is where the Antarctic becomes significantly involved, with the potential collapse of the West Antarctic ice sheet, again accelerating sea levels. In terms of mountain glaciers, this is what the Alps could look like, much as the high atlas in Morocco looks today. We will be seeing new deserts establishing in southern Europe. That includes Spain, Italy and Greece as the Sahara essentially moves onto the northern side of the Mediterranean. Even in the home counties of England, temperatures could hit 45 degrees centigrade in the summer. The last time the world was 5 degrees hotter than now was 55 million years ago at the start of the Eocene period, when there was a major global warming event, probably volcanic in origin. Even so, it took 10,000 years for temperatures to climb this high. We are looking at achieving the same rise in less than a century. This was a time when subtropical species like crocodiles and hippos lived in high Arctic, in places which are, at the time of recording, covered by ice. Part of the reason could be the worst thing one of all. There is more methane hydrate trapped in the ocean beds than all of the world's coal, oil and gas put together. Methane hydrates may well have caused a 6 degree rise at the end of the Permian period, 251 million years ago, which set the scene for the world's worst ever mass extinction, when 90% of life was wiped out. That's the nearest our Earth has ever come to becoming just another lifeless rock. 
And it's certainly a sobering thought that our children could be living through a similar catastrophe unless we act to reduce greenhouse gas emissions today. So is everyone still feeling cheerful? <laughs> so, tell me, what would be an acceptable temperature rise by 2100? I asked you this uh, last week. Have you changed your mind since then? Let's take a look. So, a little bit more for the two degree side. Yeah, absolutely. That would be my choice as well, but we'll see. Okay, so let's think about some of those things that he talked about. It was very doom and gloom, um, and there is a certain amount of truth to an awful lot of his statements. A lot of those things will take longer than he perhaps implied, um, but certainly uh, we will see really dramatic changes at those upper ends of the, the temperature possibilities. So here shows you what that temperature change will look like um, in different parts of the world. You can see that just like we've seen more warming over land and over the Arctic at high latitudes, that's going to hold true as we go into the future. And especially as we look um, up at the Arctic, you can see that really they warm almost twice as much um, as the rest of us uh, for the same temperature uh, increase. And so definitely if we look at that upper limit of the RCP 8.5 um, we're looking at temperature changes of up to maybe 11 or 12 degrees Celsius up in the, the Arctic area, and that's going to be a massive, massive change for the ecosystems there. In terms of precipitation, in terms of our rainfall, it's actually much, much more difficult to get models to agree. We have a lot less certainty about this, but we do spot trends. And those trends are that if you have a dry season and a wet season, they're going to become more intense. Um, if you have a dry area and a wet area, that difference is going to be bigger. So we're going to maintain our dry becomes drier, wet becomes wetter, both in seasons and in terms of locations. Um, and certainly you can see that with our RCP 2.6, we see a certain amount of change that change is, is massively increased um, if we go to our upper end, our 8.5. Um, and you can see that certainly over our area, there's a certain amount of uncertainty, but it looks like it'll be drying, okay? Um, if we think about the cryosphere, unsurprisingly, if temperatures go up more, we melt more ice. Um, and when we talk about Greenland and Antarctica, the warmer it gets, the more quickly they will melt um, and they will also move more quickly potentially. But they are going to take hundreds of years, if not thousands of years, to respond to temperature. Okay? In the same way that if you put a giant ice cube out on the lawn outside, it's going to take several hours to melt away. Okay? It doesn't mean that it's not going to, it just takes a long time. And so there are these lags in the system um, that will sort of come into effect. But if we look at, say, sea ice, which is really a very thin layer on top of the ocean around the Arctic, then you can see that we can melt that back much more quickly. And certainly, if we look at any of our scenarios, really it's not good news for sea ice. With our best case scenario, we maybe have summer sea ice up to maybe 2080 or so. With our, uh, so that's our worst case scenario, we lose our sea ice by 2080. Um, even with our best case scenario, we still have very little sea ice, about maybe half what we had 30 years ago in our Arctic oceans. So it's going to change dramatically. Um, and so that's the difference, okay? That's our RCP 2.6. The white and the blue shows sea ice extent. And that's what our Arctic Ocean could look like by 2100, following our upper end of these emissions. In terms of sea level rise, again, how much we warm makes a difference because that affects how much the water expands, it affects how much ice goes into the oceans. Our best case scenario, our best case scenario shows about a 45 centimetre rise in sea level. That's that much, which doesn't sound like a lot, but then if you think about high tides on top of that, storm surges on top of that, it makes all the difference. If you're only a little bit underneath your sort of sea wall, that makes a huge difference. The upper limit is more like sort of 80 centimetres, 75 centimetres. And really, we think that the upper limit is more likely because, again, we're not modelling our ice sheets very well. They seem to be responding more quickly than we think they will. Um, and hopefully a few of you might have seen this in the news last week. 
Um, this is a map of Antarctica, but perhaps an unusual view of Antarctica. You don't get to see this very often. Because when you look Ant at Antarctica, you see the gigantic ice. This is what Antarctica would look like if we took that ice off. Okay, and what do you notice about the height of Antarctica in the west over on this side? What altitude is it at? It's at minus 2,000 meters or so. Actually, western Antarctic, that ice is resting below sea level. It started building up as an ice sheet on top of land, but as it's built up and built up and built up, that ice is really heavy, and it's basically pushed down the Earth's crust. So now the base where it's sat is below sea level, and that's a problem because where we're seeing melt in Antarctica right now is where that water is in contact with ice. As that water warms up, it's really good at melting away that ice. And if that base is underwater, and basically you're going down towards the middle of the ice sheet, that water can get in and it's just going to sort of burrow down and potentially destabilize it. If it starts sort of floating, it's going to move more quickly. And so this was the really good news from last week, which was we seem to have reached a point where basically that is going to happen. It's going to take, again, a long, long time to do that, but really it's not it's possible for us to stop it at this point. So if you want to read more, um, there's an article there, and that's written by one of the, it's a study done by one of the people in our department. Okay, so pH of the oceans. Do you remember I said that we can be much more certain about this? We have those uncertainties around sea level. We have uncertainties around temperature. With carbon dioxide in the ocean, it's actually much, much easier for us to be precise about the change that we'll see. And you can see that because the error bars on there are a lot less large. Okay? So we can tell you pretty easily that if we follow our best case scenario, our pH doesn't really drop much more than it is now, maybe a 0.1 pH unit. Remember, it's a log scale, it's still a big change. But if we follow that much larger uh, emission scenario, then we're really seeing a huge change in our pH. And at that much higher change, then really we're going to see really huge rearrangement of our ecosystems in the oceans. Because at those sorts of pHs, our corals won't be able to make skeletons terribly easily. They'll basically dissolve as soon as they form. Um, and we'll see similar things in terms of the plankton that also produce shells. And we really don't have a good sense of what, what that will do to our ocean ecosystems. It's sort of not really talked about, but it's really super important. So this is a little summary of those things that we might see. So increased carbon dioxide, increased temperature, changes in precipitation patterns, continued melting of the cryosphere that leads to sea level rise as long as uh, oceans are warming as well this decrease in pH, and also things like changes in the intensity of hurricanes, changes in the intensity of drought, those sorts of things. Okay. And I think it's also worth saying that we keep talking about 2100 as if it's the end of all things. The world will continue to exist after 2100, and I think it's very short-sighted of us to just think of the next 100 years. Because really, if we think about a lot of government buildings, if we think about most sort of cities in Europe, they've been around for hundreds of years. We don't want to just think about what's going to happen in the next hundred, we want to think further in time. And so these graphs just show you that if you look forward in time, that CO2 doesn't magically disappear once we hit 2100, it will still be in the atmosphere. These changes will increase, okay? They will continue to occur. So. You saw a little bit about how that's going to affect humans and ecosystems, but let's look in a little bit more detail. So first of all, food. It's important to all of us. Um, and really what we tend to see is that as the climate changes, where you can grow certain crops tends to shift as well. And so if we look at perhaps the Central Valley, some of the, the crops there are really at their southern limit of where they can grow due to high temperatures. And so if we see increased temperatures, then they're going to have to shift where they grow these crops. And that's a problem if you're a farmer. That's the land you own. That's where you want to grow things. And so good land potentially for sort of growing crops in the future might be Canada. They might do well out of this. Okay? Um, so definitely we'll see shifts in where we're producing food, but also how much crop yield we get. And especially as we get more and more people, we need, really need to maintain that 
crop yield, and that's going to be difficult with a, a different climate. Um, at the coasts, uh, really, we're going to have a look at this in a second, but we do see millions of people displaced by increasing sea level. We might be okay around us, apart from maybe Newport Beach, Huntington Beach, these low-lying areas. If you look at the east coast, it tends to be much flatter going inland, and so there's more of a, a threat there. In terms of health, as you get more heat waves, as you get uh, more extremes, um, as we change those where those diseases and sort of vectors like mosquitoes can be found, there's going to be uh, effects on our health system. And often those affect the more vulnerable uh, rather than the, the more wealthy. So here's a little test for you. If you're in oceanography, if you're in ESS1, keep your mouth shut, see if the others can get it. So tell me, which is the US state with the lowest average elevation above sea level? So a geography question for you. If you're not from the US, ask the person around you. <laughs> so what do you think? Which is the lowest state? OK. So the majority vote A. There's a good chunk in my class who's been here before because they voted B. And B is the right answer. Delaware is actually the lowest average state by elevation, OK? It's not the one that we talk about most often. When we talk about sea level rise, we often end up talking about Florida. But Delaware is not in a good way in terms of climate change as well. So looking at the US, you can see that the red areas there show what area of land would potentially be flooded by a one meter sea level rise, which is the upper limit of what we're thinking about by the end of the century. It's really not out of the question at all. Okay. And that's a big chunk of land. It's going to cost a lot to try and move people from there. It's going to cost a lot to try and protect it. Okay? And remember, we're not just talking about that. We're thinking longer term about sort of several meters. Okay? And so the orange area is what six meters would do to our coastlines. And Miami, poor old Miami. Miami is not going to do well with this. It's built on really porous rock. So that seawater, you can't really keep it out terribly easily. They're already starting to see flooding. And also, what tends to hit Miami and Florida every now and again? Hurricanes. And that's the real concern. As they get even sort of closer to sea level, there's going to be much more of an impact. So that's what Miami looks like with one meter of sea level rise. And they brought some very nice people from the Netherlands across because they have a very uh, elaborate system of protecting the coastline. And they said, what would we need to do to protect Miami? And they went away and they thought about it for a while and probably got well paid for a while. And they came back and they said, not a lot. That's it. OK? So they care about this an awful lot. But ultimately, we're a pretty wealthy nation. We have options. If you go to countries like Bangladesh next to India, it's really not in a good way. It has this enormous coastline, lots of inlets. It has big rivers coming down. It's a really flat, low-lying country. It's also impacted by big cyclones and hurricanes. Okay? And really, if you look there, a one meter rise in sea level would flood 20% of the country. It's an enormously populated country. And it would move 14.8 million people. So first of all, where would they go? It's already very, very populated. There's not a lot of room. They're also mainly farmers. If you move them, they need land in order to live. So really, the question is, would we be willing to take them? If the sea level is rising because of emissions from the developed world, would we be willing to take climate refugees? It's a very interesting question. But even these guys are better off than these guys. Okay. This is Tuvalu. You could say the same of the Maldives and of a lot of those uh, sort of coral islands, basically, in the Pacific and other oceans. Most of their land is within one meter of sea level rise. So they're looking at, potentially, within this century, having to leave their country, this country potentially not existing anymore. And so that was, this is what the Tuvalu government uh, official said, by refusing to ratify the Kyoto Protocol, the US has effectively denied future generations of Tuvaluans their fundamental freedom to live where our ancestors have lived. And I think that's really sobering. Newport Beach, they'll be fine. But these guys, this is their country, and they're going to have to potentially leave it. And I think that's terribly sad. Um, other things, water. 
water is going to be incredibly important in the next 100 years. We're not using it sustainably here. We're not using it sustainably elsewhere. Um, and really, uh, hundreds of millions of people get exposed to increased water stress. And that just gets worse as we increase our temperatures. Um, ecosystems, if we look at 2 degrees Celsius, our two line on here, up to 30% of species risk extinction at 2 degrees. By the time you go up to 4 and 5, really we're talking about sort of mass extinctions um, around the globe. Um, certainly corals don't do well from either the acidity of the ocean but also increased temperature. Um, we also get increased wildfire risk. Um, we're already seeing that else around uh, here. And this is a graph that you saw in um, discussions for those of you who went this week. And it shows, it's a bit of a complicated diagram, but it basically, the, that white bar gives you a sense of how quickly things can move. How quickly the average tree can move um, and migrate, which unsurprisingly, it's a tree, not far, okay? It's gonna take a while to spread sort of seeds. And so you have to think about how quickly a lot of these ecosystems can respond. And so the, sort of the higher up the emissions sort of scenarios we get, the more rapidly our climate is going to change. And so the more ecosystems we're going to leave behind. Okay? Um, and so that's the concern. It's the speed of this change. The world has been warmer in the past. We didn't lose lots of species. They had time to move. They had time to adapt. We're not necessarily giving them that time. Um, and this is a really interesting document. If you want to learn more about the US in particular, different regions of it, different sectors of it, like the agricultural, the health sector, the water sector, this is the place to go. It was um, published earlier this year, has a really cool website you can explore. And I thought um, that you might want to see what they're telling us about the southwest US. This is the message for us, the five key points about how our climate was going to change, which is that snow pack and stream flow are projected to decrease, and that decreases our water supply um, for both cities, agriculture, and ecosystems. Big uh, economy-related uh, things. Reduced yields of high-value crops. Think about the Central Valley um, due to higher temperatures and increased water stress. Increased warming and drought. And in the natural ecosystem where we're not irrigating, that tends to lead to drier vegetation, more wildfires. Um, flooding and erosion in coastal areas. But also, even just higher temperatures in cities uh, leads to disruptions to things like electricity. We all know what is coming when it's really, really super hot. Everyone turns their air conditioning on. We get blackouts. And that's potentially going to increase in the future. Okay? So those are the messages for us here uh, where we are. So hopefully the question you're asking and the question we have to ask really is what can we do what can we do to avoid some of the worst of these changes? Because it's pretty sobering, and we would like to stick closer to the bottom end, the 2 degrees Celsius change if possible. Um, so what can we do? So first of all is uh, the slightly interesting out-of-the-box thinking, which is we can find strategies to reduce the amount of carbon dioxide that's in our atmosphere. Can we find ways of extracting it? Or if we can't, can we mess with some other aspect of the climate system that would mean that we wouldn't warm up as much? Okay? And this is something that we call geoengineering. And there's some fascinating ideas. And there are some simply crazy ideas. Um, and I'll show you a couple of these in a minute. But really, the second one is to reduce our emissions. Okay? So first of all, it's a beautiful figure that I've stolen from the New Scientist magazine. And this shows you some various uh, options for reducing our climate warming, OK? And that includes things like space mirrors, OK? So if we can't reduce emissions, well, let's just fly up and sort of put up space mirrors between us and the sun to reflect some of the incoming radiation. Sounds good in theory, OK? The problem is it would cost us way more than just reducing the emissions in the first place, OK? Second thing, it's centuries away from actually being able to do that. It's a nice idea, but we couldn't until a few hundred years from now. Okay? But it would be very effective. So those blue dots show you how effective something would be. Um, the little sort of dollar signs show you how much it would cost. So cheap compared to cutting emissions, about the same or more. Um, and that readiness shows you how soon could we do it. Okay? So there's a lot of options on here. And so I want you to concentrate on just three of them. Okay, or four of them rather, 
So here are four of these solutions on here. So find those four on here and have a think about how each of them would work to affect our climate. And in particular, think about which one of those, and only one of those will do it, which one of those would actually um, act to stop ocean acidification as well, to stop the pH change of the ocean. Okay? So take a couple of minutes to look at it, and then we'll come, I'll ask the question. We have a winner. We do, indeed, foresting. So why would foresting help us reduce ocean acidification? What's it doing? Yeah, it's actually taking CO2 out of the environment. Okay? It's taking it out of the atmosphere. All of these other ideas, space mirrors, it's a really fun idea. I love the idea. But it's not addressing the real cause of the problem, which is that there's extra CO2 in the atmosphere. And we're not just trying to solve the problem of warming. We're trying to solve this problem that if we don't address CO2 emissions, we're going to see catastrophic change to our ocean ecosystems as well. So absolutely, space mirrors, nice idea, um, a long way away. Aerosols, again, it's an interesting idea. I think we, we run the risk that we really don't necessarily know what sort of going, that is going to do. Um, and given our uncertainties already in aerosols, it's, it's difficult to justify messing around like that. Cloud seeding, this is a really nice idea. These sort of ships that go along and produce, uh, sort, of, sort of basically uh, pump out um, sort of uh, moisture into the atmosphere and produce clouds over a lot of our oceans. But again, they don't address the fundamental point, which is that we need to remove CO2. Um, there are things that are more ready. Things like ocean fertilization is something that people talk about a lot. There are some areas in the ocean that don't have the nutrients in order to be able to have lots of life. If we go and dump lots of, say, iron, which is a nice limiting nutrient, into the ocean, then lots of life can take in that CO2 and theoretically remove it. Unfortunately, what we find is if we go out and study this, there's really a tiny amount of CO2 that's actually locked away in that organic material. Mostly what happens is that, that that organic matter that's produced tends to get eaten by other things and a lot of that carbon dioxide returns to the atmosphere. Um, but these are nice ideas and we need out-of-the-box thinking. We really do want to find a way of taking CO2 out of the atmosphere. That would really help us out enormously. So that leaves us with reducing our emissions. Okay? So most people have heard of the Kyoto Protocol. It was an agreement in the, sort of the late 90s now, a long time ago, to reduce carbon emissions to 5% below 1990 levels. Um, and this was a big meeting. All of the world's countries came, um, and everyone sort of agreed to it. So green shows all of the countries in the world that signed this agreement and are actually acting on it. Brown shows the ones that sort of think it's a nice idea, but don't really want to do it. Red is even worse. They signed up for it, they acted on it, and now they've found lots of tar sands in Canada, um, which is nice, cheap energy. Um, and so they were going to face pretty heavy economic um, sort of fines by um, sort of not meeting their emissions goals. And so they withdrew. And this is the problem with a lot of these international agreements, is that there's no real consequence um, about this yet. Okay. So, for those of you in discussions this week, you'll already have a good sense of this. But how much of our known fossil fuels have we used up already? So how much of our fossil fuels have we used? See, and hopefully a few people have learned something from discussion. <laughs> so I can tell you that the people that went to discussion were because uh, they voted A. <laughs> we have used less than 25% of the available fossil fuels on Earth. So this is a familiar diagram to everyone from discussion. So you can see that we have good, used up a good chunk of our oil, and we're using it very, very rapidly right now. And so really we're thinking about being at peak oil or sort of running out of oil in sort of decades or so. Gas. Again, we haven't used as much of it, but we're using it much more quickly now. We're potentially going to run out sometime um, in sort of decades, to maybe 100 years. Coal, 
We can keep burning coal for a really long time, okay? There's an awful lot of coal still left, and of all of the fossil fuels, coal is one of the worst in terms of how much carbon you emit for the amount of energy you get, okay? So coal is not something that we want people to burn. It's not going to be good for us. And I also wanted to make this point that I love this graph, but it was made in 2006. If anyone wants to make me an updated version, I'd love you forever. But um, you can see that there's this other column, which it says reserve growth. Okay. So we have tar sands in 2006 with just some idea. Okay. Canada, they thought that was a good idea. They're now using those tar sands. So it's no longer reserve growth. We're actually exploiting those. Shale oil, this is something you haven't heard of necessarily, but it's things like oil and gas that are within um, mud rocks, so they don't sort of flow very easily. Has anyone heard of fracking? That's how we get hold of that. <laughs> okay, so we've now started doing that. And actually, the use of fracking has actually helped us reduce our carbon emissions. Isn't that really strange? That's because we all of a sudden have much more natural gas. We have more of this gas column than we had before, and so we stop burning as much coal, which is really polluting. We're now burning gas, which is still producing CO2, but it doesn't produce as much CO2. Um, methane hydrates, that's not something that we've heard of a lot. It's basically methane that's frozen at the bottom of our uh, ocean, in our ocean sediments. Um, and last year, hooray, for the first time, someone successfully managed to extract methane hydrates. Um, and that could be another huge source of energy. In particular, Japan are very interested in that. They don't have oil, gas, or uh, coal, um, but they do have a lot of methane hydrates sat off their coast. So, the idea behind this graph is we have a lot of fossil fuels left. The decision isn't going to be made for us. We could potentially increase CO2 in the atmosphere by a huge amount. So really, this does need to be a conscious decision. It's not going to be something where once we run out, we have to switch anyway. This is something that we really do need to, to make a decision about. Um, but the good news is, is that we absolutely have technologies available to us that could help us reduce our CO2 emissions. So first of all, we could just be much more efficient with how we use energy. Okay? Energy efficiency could save a huge chunk of our CO2 emissions each year. Okay? Renewable e electricity, by expanding that, we could also save a, a big chunk of our carbon emissions. Geologic disposal, this is the idea we can extract CO2 from the atmosphere and pump it back into the ground into that empty space where we took the oil from to begin with. So it's a nice idea. Um, and that could save us a little bit. Vehicle efficiency, better mileage for your cars. Okay. And that's already something that we're working on. Low carbon fuels, so things like natural gas rather than burning coal. Um, smart growth, I'm not really sure what smart growth is, I'm afraid, but smart growth. Um, forest soil carbon, managing the land differently could also take in. So all of these things are available to us. What's the problem? What do you think the problem is? It's expensive, okay? It's expensive. Um, and there, aren't, there are winners and losers in all of these things. Okay? It's not that one thing is going to magically save us. There's always going to be people that suffer as a result of that. Um, so for example, if we're burning less coal, that's going to affect the coal mining industry in the US. And that's, that's hard for those people. Um, but we're not going to have any easy decisions. It's not going to be an easy process. So hopefully everyone has seen the news this week and saw that actually for the first time in a very long time, I have to update my slides, okay? Because you can't imagine how depressing it is to give this lecture every quarter um, and never really have anything new to say. And now I have something new to say. So, we had an announcement on Monday that the Environmental Protection Agency, following on from their declaration that carbon dioxide was a hazardous gas that could be regulated, they are actually going to enact some regulations. And in particular, they're going to try and regulate the power sector. So if we look, this is our sort of US emissions um, by those different sectors, things like industry, commercial, um, sort of residence, uh, um, agriculture, transport, and electricity. So they're targeting electricity, which produces maybe a third of the carbon emissions that we see each year. Okay? And I also want 
wanted to give you this in context because the nice thing about our CO2 emissions is actually they have been dropping in the last few years. There's a couple of different reasons for that. You can see there's a bit of a dip. Where was our dip? What year was our dip? 2008? What happened in 2008 in the US? <coughs> the economic downturn. Okay, not good news for anyone else, good news for carbon emissions, the economic downturn. Okay. Also, that, sort of, that use of natural gas from fracking rather than burning coal has also been allowing us to drop. Just increased vehicle efficiencies, things like electric cars have helped us in that way as well. Okay. So we are making progress. But really, we need to make more progress. And uh, you can find out a whole bunch of stuff from these websites that I've put at the bottom here. So what will these new regulations do? What is all the fuss about? So um, the idea is that these power plants account for a huge amount of the carbon emissions that we see. And it's relatively easy to regulate a few power companies rather than everybody's cars, OK, or sort of airliners or something like that. So the idea is, is that we have new regulations that will limit the carbon emissions uh, from these power stations. There are already limits on sulfur gases um, to restrict acid rain, particles, things like arsenic and mercury that are in sort of coal in particular that get released to the environment when it's burnt. Um, but this is sort of the first regulation of actually carbon dioxide itself. And so by 2030, the plan is to reduce carbon emissions from pa that power sector by 30%. That's a really significant change at last. Okay, this is a really big deal. Um, and by doing that, we're actually, as a byproduct of it, without sort of any extra sort of input, um, we're also going to cut these other types of pollution, um, things like particles, um, sulfur gases, by 25%. Mostly because we're going to be burning a lot less coal with this plan. Um, and also, I'm not quite sure how they work this out, but in theory. This should cut your electricity bill, okay? And why is that on there? That doesn't really seem to make any sense. It's because of my last point. These regulations allow an awful lot of flexibility in how individual states go about sort of actually cutting these emissions. It doesn't actually need to be reduced carbon dioxide coming out of the power station. If you can cut the electricity demand, you can sort of so increase efficiency. If you can sort of boost renewable energy, then you can do all of these things. You can make sure that you cut these emissions, um, and ideally, uh, that efficiency will also save people money as well. Um, so that's the idea. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about it um, as sort of the plans come uh, sort of forward in the next few years. Okay. I also wanted to mention something that a lot of people just don't know about which is that California itself, um, so the US as a country, has not been sort of terribly uh, sort of forward in acting on climate change. But individual states often have been. And California is one of those states. So they set goals a little while ago. They set um, a goal that we would be, by 2020, we'd have 17% less emissions than 2013. And we're going to meet those partly because of the economic downturn, which they weren't really counting on, um, which sort of helped them out a bit. But we're going to meet that 2020 goal. But I want you to think about this next one. The next emissions uh, goal that we want to meet is a drop of 80% below 1990 emissions by 2050. And that's a little bit more ambitious. Um, and there's an awful lot of effort going in right now to try and work out how on earth we would do that. Because if you look at the breakdown, you can't stop fueling things like airplanes right now um, with things other than fossil fuels. So you can't necessarily cut down on that. So what that means is that all of our cars by 2050 would have to be electric cars. OK? So that means if we uh, sort of try and, and we make the goal of meeting the standard, all of our cars by 2050 are going to be um, sort of electric rather than gas. And if you think about the infrastructure that you would need to replace in order to do that, things like gas stations everywhere, not going to need those anymore. We would need instead charging stations. It's a really different system. Okay? And here's just sort of one theory. This isn't necessarily uh, the way that we would do things, but this again is sort of thinking about 
it's not one answer, it's a whole combination of technologies and different policies that we could use. So things like electricity or energy efficiency could save us a huge amount. And in fact, one of the best ways of being energy efficient here in California is being water efficient, because so much of our energy goes on moving water around. Okay? Um, then we have things like taking carbon out of the energy sector, so expanding our renewable energy, things like wind, things like solar. Um, it's not going to always save us, and I'll tell you why. We could easily power the whole of the US with wind farms in sort of Kansas, Oklahoma, and those central states. But we would only be able to do it for about two hours a day when it gets windy in the morning and it gets windy at night. Okay? And so the challenge is, is that we have to try and build in these renewable energy sources, which are very variable through time. At the same time, we had these nice power stations that just gave us steady output. And you can't switch on and switch off a power station just like that. Okay? And so we have to try and have, we have all of these engineering challenges to try and build in this much more variable supply into our sort of big electricity grid. Okay? Other things, things like biofuels, um, uh, sort of non, sort of uh, changing our, our energy sectors. Okay. So, I asked you how many would of you pay for gas? And then they announced this, and so I've changed it a bit. So how many of you would be willing to spend a bit more on your electricity in order to cut carbon emissions and sort of follow more of those low RCP scenarios rather than the high ones? So knowing the consequences of our decisions. OK, let's see if people would do this one. Oh, we've had a bit of a reversal. I'm glad to see it. I wonder if it would have been the same way if I'd still said gas, but anyway. Um, great. I think this is the point, and that's the point is, is that there's so much misinformation. People need the real information, and once you have the real information, unlike Tuesday where I said there's a right or wrong answer, there isn't. I'm a scientist. I can tell you what the consequences of these uh, decisions will be, but really it's up to you guys. It's up to the polit political system, it's up to the world to decide which of these futures you want. Okay? And so that's really the bottom line. And if you decide that you're willing to deal with these worst changes, that's fine. That's your decision. Okay? And I might disagree with it, but it's your decision. Okay? So I think that's the main thing, just to, to be educated about what the consequences are. So I think I have some questions to ask you, which is, uh, ultimately, the world will not end if we do hit those upper limits. Okay? It will be drastically different, however. And so really the question is, sort of, what sort of world do you want to live in? Other questions are related to sort of how fair and how um, you want to think about the world in general. Because here in the US, we're not going to get the worst effects, and we have resources to be able to adapt. Um, but that's not true necessarily everywhere. Um, things, places like Tuvalu, the poorer nations, are not going to have those resources. And so um, what responsibility do we have to those other people that will suffer as a response of our decisions? Um, how much responsibility should we take as a developed world, given that we are responsible for most of the emissions so far, given that we keep saying, well, China and India keep producing more CO2, do we have the right to stop them bettering the lives of their population? Um, we basically did that, and that's why we're in this situation. Um, what role should the government have? To what extent? Individual actions can help. Every individual action can help. But really, if we're going to tackle those big sectors like industry, things like um, power uh, sectors, we do need some sort of government role. And so I then have three last slides, so please don't pack up, because we will finish a little bit early. Which is, I want to thank the TAs, I don't know where they are right now, but thank them for all their hard work. So, thank you. And also to thank you guys, because I know it's hard work tackling a science class, um, and I don't make it easy for you. So thank you for your hard work as well. I hope that you view the world a little differently. And then I have one last image to show you. And I always like ending this way. So let's take a look at my very last image. 
going to get dark. OK. So here's my last image. Can you spot the Earth? <laughs> yes? So I want you to think about this. This is the Earth. This is the furthest photo that was ever taken of the Earth. Um, and there's a beautiful piece which I've included on the next slide that you can take away and read with you by Carl Sagan. It's, he calls it the pale blue dot. And he makes the point that that is it, that is us. Everything that has ever happened, every person that has ever lived has been on that dot. There is nowhere else we can go. There is no other planet we can move to. And so really we want to think about what we can do to protect where we are um, and be nicer to the people around us. Okay, thanks guys.